Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Ramadan Journey. I am your host, Afif Khan, and we have along with us on our journey Imam uh, Muhammad al Asi. He is the author of the Ascendant Quran. In the last program, we were talking about certain issues related to the Hajj, and this program will pick up on some of those issues. Uh, Imam al Asi, welcome. Thank you. Uh, in the last program, uh, you had mentioned that uh, that in your judgment, Makkah was only physically liberated, uh, that it is still awaiting a psychological liberation, and uh, that uh, a committed group of uh, organized Muslims, uh, an organized Muslim social self, is necessary in the modern day to to liberate Makkah psychologically. Uh, what exactly did you mean by this? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil mursaleen. Rahmatillahi lil alameen. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi al mayameen. It's a fact, it's a historical fact that the year before the Prophet والسلام, passed away, Mecca became Islamic territory, just like Al Medina. In other words, the Mushrikun, the Mushriks, were no longer in control of Mecca. They had resisted Islam fought against the Prophet and the committed Muslims in a stretch of almost 23 years. But now, when the Muslims gained the momentum and they liberated, at least physically li liberated Mecca, we had a, a phenomenon called a tulaqa. Uh, and that word is attributed to the Prophet's statement when he finally returned to Mecca and all of these people who were opposing him who in the last day when they saw that Islam is the wave of the future said we are now Muslims and the Prophet of course took them at face value um, he stood in front of them and he said مَا تَظُنُّونَ أَنِّي فَاعِلٌ الْيَوْمَ بِكُمْ He said, what do you think I'm going to do today with you? They responded, قَالُوا أَخٌ كَرِيمٌ وَبْنُ أَخٍ كَرِيمٌ They said to him, but you're uh, uh, an honorable brother and an honorable nephew. He said, you are free to go now. You are released. The, um, the meaning here is that they incurred some type of punishment for having gone to war against Allah's Prophet and the committed Muslims. And now, in normal circumstances, many of them would be prisoners of war for all of the crimes that they committed against the Prophet and the established Islamic order. But he didn't do that. He didn't take them as those who deserve to be taken as prisoners of war. He amnestied them. So these were released and amnestied. So they're called at tulaqa And... Um, it appears from you know reading further into Islamic history that they were not in the depths of them committed to Islam. The the asabiya, the uh, clannishness, and the tribalism, and the um, in today's world it's equivalent to the nationalism in its negative sense, uh, were still there. 
under the surface in Mecca. Uh, and that would explain to a certain degree why the Islamic leadership in Medina, whether it's the Prophet himself, alayhi wa alihi salatu wa salam, or whether it was al Khulafa who came after him. They didn't move their administration or their um, uh, central authority from al Madina to Mecca. They never did that because they knew quite well that the people in Mecca, even though they've declared their Islam, they said the Shahadatain, they're in, right now uh, Muslims, uh, presumably like everyone else, but beneath them, you know, you can't erase. 23 years of warfare and bloodshed and revenge and reactionism. You can't erase that in a very small period of time. So what I mean by uh, Mecca has to be liberated, uh, to be more uh, detailed about it, is the process that began with Allah's Prophet for a total and thorough liberation of Mecca which uh, did not take place. I know these are very um, uh, maybe uh, imposing words, uh, but I think an, uh, an objective person reviewing Islamic history would agree to the fact that there was an Islamic power and an Islamic authority, and there was a counter-Islamic power and a counter-Islamic authority. And... Mecca was a place where counter-Islam could have gained momentum and later on did uh, express uh, some type of support for the Asabiyya that put an end to the reign of the Khulafa. And therefore, uh, today we are living with a Mecca that has come to us throughout all of these centuries uh, without a total liberation, especially a psychological one in which al-Iman is deep-rooted. Uh, and therefore, when al-Hajj is performed in it, it's performed in the full sense of the word with a deep commitment that comes with an Iman that can be expressed in a, to a totally and thoroughly liberated Mecca. And uh, at this point, we have to take a short break from our sponsors. Uh, we will continue with this discussion about the Hajj. Uh, please stay, stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome Ramadan. Welcome Ramadan. Uh, welcome back. Uh, our topic of conversation is the Hajj. And we'll continue uh, our previous discussion. Uh, Imam, uh, uh, the Quran identifies Makkah as a sanctuary. And uh, this particular part of the world, uh, what many people call the Middle East, uh, the Muslim East, uh, it's beset by wars of occupation, by serial dislocations, refugees, uh, people being forced to leave their homes. Uh, by virtue of Mecca being a sanctuary, why can't these people go to Mecca to recharge, uh, to try to reintegrate themselves back into society by going to the sanctuary that Allah created for them? You see, there's an ayah in the Qur'an that says, وَإِذْ جَعَلْنَا الْبَيْتَ مَثَابَةً لِلنَّاسِ وَأَمْنَا uh, which means, bear in mind that we have designated Al-Bayt. This is in reference to Al-Bayt Al-Haram, which is the holy sanctuary in Mecca. Mathabatan linnas, a retreat for people, an asylum for people, and a sanctuary for people. Mathaba, you refer to, in hard times, you go back to as a shelter and a refuge, mathaba, for people, linnas. 
I, I know the, the wording tolerates the, um, the contextualization of Nas as being only Muslims. But there's nothing that I know of that said Mecca is off limits to the oppressed and the homeless of the world. Nothing that I know of. They can be of whatever background that they come from, religiously or geographically or culturally or whatever. Because you see, Mecca came into existence as a home for the homeless. Prophet Ibrahim and Ismail alayhima as-salatu was salam they built the haram in Mecca. They actually initiated Mecca when it was nothing. There was barren sands there when Hajar and Ismail were left there by Ibrahim. There was nothing there. But as Allah's will would have it, Ismail began to die physically and literally. He was beginning to die. Uh, an infant who was just born from Hajar and Allah caused the spring of Zamzam to come into existence. And because of Zamzam, well, because of Ismail, there was Zamzam. Because of Ismail's survival, there was Zamzam. And because of Zamzam, there was the survival of the others who came to settle there. And Ibrahim was one of them. And Ibrahim, uh, Ibrahim's history is a history to be told probably on another occasion. But he, Mecca, Ibrahim was dislocated from his original land, which is today the Iraqi geography of that area. He was also a foreigner in these other territories, which are called the Holy Lands, all the way to Egypt. But then he finally found home in the Arabian Peninsula in Mecca. Uh, so the ayah says, وَإِذْ جَعَلْنَا الْبَيْتَ مَثَابَةً لِلنَّاسِ وَأَمْنَ And a place of security and safety. Um, unfortunately, that's not the way it is today. There are those who have um, defined Mecca by rules and laws and regulations. Uh, to have it off limits to anyone who is not a Muslim. Now, we should be aware that there's an ayah in the Qur'an that says that the mushriks are najas, meaning that they are um, polluted. And we don't have time to go into that, but let's say that they are, in the ideological sense and in the religious sense, they are polluted. So, they shouldn't so they should not c come into close proximity with al masjid al haram after this their year which was at the end of the revelation of the quran but that's uh, the mushrikeen it didn't say anything about the rest of humanity of especially those who are homeless, for which Mecca came into existence to begin with. Right, and the mushrikeen are part of an organized opposition against the promotion of the truth and of justice and uh, right. the movement to get rid of oppression. And we can't consider that the oppressed belong to that movement. That's right. They're affected by, yeah. <laughs> by that. Uh, so uh, it by should be opened to them, not to, pr of course, they're not going to go there to perform any religious rituals or the duties that are incumbent upon Muslims. No one's going to expect them to go to But they are, at least, they should have the um, opportunity to see what Islam stands for. The irony of it is, even if, if they were to go there today, there's no, there's a meaningless Mecca. There's, there's nothing they could see there that would offer them the meanings and the solutions that they are looking for. So uh, Mecca is, um, as per this ayah, وَإِذْ جَعَلْنَا الْبَيْتَ مَثَابَةً لِلنَّاسِ وَأَمْنَا وَاتَّخِذُوا مِنْ مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ مُصَلَّى 
The other thing that I want to mention here is Allah says وَأَذِّنْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجِّ يَأْتُوكَ رِجَالًا وَعَلَى كُلِّ ضَامِرٍ يَأْتِينَ مِنْ كُلِّ فَجٍ عَمِيقٍ لِيَشْهَدُوا مَنَافِعَ لَهُمْ uh, this final uh, sentence لِيَشْهَدُوا مَنَافِعًا لَهُمْ So that they who are coming to Mecca either as Mu'tamireen or as Hujjaj performing the Umrah or performing the Hajj they should be able to witness they should be privy to benefits and advantages to them and these are not specifically spiritual advantages they cover the gamut of life itself. Uh, we're going to continue this discussion into the next segment. Uh, please stay with us. We'll be right back. And welcome back. Uh, we're talking about the Hajj. Uh, Imam, you've uh, said in the past that uh, the Prophet spent uh, his entire 23-year mission in trying to liberate Makkah. And uh, uh, towards the end of his uh, mission, uh, he achieved the physical liberation of Makkah. Uh, what ought to be the goal uh, for the vast majority of Muslims in the world today? What ought to be their primary strategic objective? I think that the Muslims today should understand the Prophet alayhi as-salatu was in the uh, total sphere or range in the strategy that he had. You know when Muslims read or study such things as the Battle of Badr or the Battle of Uhud or the Battle of Al-Khandaq, or the Battle of Hunayn. They study this and they'll tell you, you know, this is how it happened and this is where it happened, this is the time it happened in. You know, they'll go through these uh, micro details. But they don't put the whole picture together. Okay, we had this battle and we had that, and we add this and we add that. Where is this leading us up to? What was going on here? Was there something going on? Yeah, there was something going on. There was a... Muhammadi strategy that was meant to um, go back to Mecca to liberate Mecca and that's why these wars were occurring if the Prophet may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him and his if he wasn't concerned with Mecca and he could have said I mean why should I bump why should I you know uh, take on the mushriks in Mecca there's a big world out there and we have a place in Medina. We have a place in Medina, and we'll probably find a little less resistance if we go, let's say, eastward towards Bahrain, or if we go uh, westwards towards Al Habasha and Africa and these areas. Uh, it's probably a little easier to do it there than to be knocking heads with Mecca throughout all of this time period. But the problem with today's Muslims is they look at what the Prophet did, but they look at the. Uh, the immediacy of what he did and they don't they don't add what he did up together they'll say the prophet's sunnah is and then they'll talk about a miswak and then they'll talk about how you enter a restroom and how how you behave in the kitchen and the bedroom and these things even the battles are like ends in themselves the battle's over <laughs> yeah that's right that's, that's what i was saying i mean they they study the battle okay there was a battle there and this is the way it went okay and then when then what what is there a connection between badr and uhud the the reason first of all the reason the the the, the muslims engaged the mushriks in badr was because of the caravan the muslims were displaced the Muslims in Mecca, the Muslims from Mecca who came to Al Medina were displaced people. They were, in today's language, they were something, something like expatriates or refugees or, you know, they were like that. They were living in, in, in Al Medina. And they were denied, they didn't have their homes, their property, their assets, their wealth. All of that was left behind in Mecca. And the Mushriks were not concerned with, oh, wait a minute, they left us, let them take whatever belongs to them with them. They repossessed what belonged to the Muslims. So the Muslims were trying to do justice here, to get justice 
uh, to retake uh, what belonged to them. And the mushriks didn't want this to happen. The mushriks looked at it as a matter of trying to defeat the Prophet. The Prophet looked at it as a matter of trying to get this force of injustice out of the way. So that justice will take its course all the way from al Medina to Mecca and from there to the world onwards. So Mecca was a, a, a concentration of the Prophet. It was a sunnah of 23 years. It wasn't a sunnah of two minutes or a sunnah of five minutes. It was a sunnah of 23 years. And the Muslims are incapable of identifying it. They look at the small stuff, the micro, but they can't see the, ma they see the micro sunnah, but they can't see the macro sunnah. This is, the pro this is the problem we have. That's why we're not getting anywhere. And that's why we have the likes of those who impose themselves and rule over Mecca and al Medina with brute force, equivalent to some type of occupation. What's the difference between Muslims not being able to go to Al Quds and Muslims not being able to go to Mecca and al Medina? Is there any difference here? Is it just because some people in Al Quds who are controlling it? perform their rituals in one way, and the, the people who are running Mecca and al Medina perform their rituals in another way? Is that the big, you know, uh, barrier here? Is it the big uh, uh, impossibility of seeing the facts? I mean, come on, let's uh, liberate ourselves. By the way, these people who perform uh, different rituals in Jerusalem, they believe in, in, in one God. They say, La ilaha illallah. There's more theological commonality between those who have occupied Al-Quds and those who've occupied Mecca and al Medina. Of course, they don't say Muhammad Rasulullah, they say Musa Rasulullah. So it's, this is not a matter of theology. This is a matter of justice and it's a matter of obtaining that justice. The Prophet explained that to us and that's what we have to learn. Once we learn, then I don't mean learning it in an academic sense. I mean learning it in a practical sense. Once we learn this in a practical sense, I think Mecca and Medina and Al-Quds will be liberated in no time at all. Okay, it looks like uh, we're getting to the uh, end of our uh, 30 programs for Ramadan. Could you make a few brief comments about the Eid coming up? Yes. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, have this Eid, a Eid in which the message, of, the message of Ramadan is satisfied. The message of Ramadan is a hungry message. And hopefully the hunger that we have experienced will feed this message so that Al Eid will become one of joy and one of happiness in the fact that we were able to defeat hunger and poverty. Uh, I know this is far from being accomplished this Eid, but hopefully with this in mind, it will be an accomplishment in the Eids to come. وَكُلُّ عَامٍ وَأَنْتُمْ بِخَيْرٍ And uh, this concludes uh, our 30 programs for the month of Ramadan. Uh, we are very happy that you did join us uh, this year. Uh, I think that uh, uh, with the discussions that we've had out of the Ascendant Qur'an, uh, the first ever tafsir of the Qur'an written directly in the English language by Imam Muhammad al-Asi, uh, we've tried to do our part uh, to contribute to a better understanding of Ramadan and the greater uh, issues that it's associated with. Uh, I too uh, wish uh, all of you uh, a very happy and a prosperous Eid. And I hope that uh, we'll have a time next year to engage each other again. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.